Hello, good afternoon. My name is Sidney Kleiner. I'm a surgeon, a general surgeon, a colorectal surgeon, and president of the Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's a pleasure for me to be here at South by Southwest 2024 to discuss the important topic of how international collaboration can promote health equity. Globally, the healthcare sector experiences many major challenges, with social and economic burdens pushing healthcare systems to their limits. These systems are facing significant budgetary pressures, with treatment costs growing exponentially due to the high cost of new technologies, of innovation, aging, chronic disease and oncology, and so on. At the same time, much of the world's population is not covered by any healthcare system or does not have access to quality care. This is a social problem. According to the World Health Organization, three in every 10 people worldwide are unable to seek medical care and almost 2 billion people are faced with catastrophic treatment costs that drag entire families into poverty, especially in the most vulnerable regions. Here in the US alone, more than 40% of all families have some level of medical debt. And as a result of aging global population, which is now occurring across the entire planet, an even larger number of people will soon need medical care and constant attention. To complicate, to complicate matters further, climate change has created additional health pressures and the threat of new epidemics require us to operate for impacts that are as yet unknown. Within this complex situation, what are the most promising trends and solutions? How can collaboration and technology serve as great allies in the much-needed transformation of healthcare? And to participate for that discussion, we are joined by a representative of some of the most highly respected philanthropic hospitals in the world. Here on the panel with me are Dr. Linda Bosserman, Professor of Medical Oncology, and Therapeutics Research and Medical Director for Center of International Medicine at City of Hope, California, a hospital that is internationally renowned in oncological care and that has established international partnerships to improve cancer treatment around the world. Thank you, Linda. Professor Eyal Zimlichman, Chief Transformation Officer and Chief Innovation Officer at Sheba Medical Center in Israel, Tel Aviv, which is the largest hospital in the Middle East with a wide network of innovation centers all over the world. And Eric Harnish, Vice President of Partner Programs at Mayo Clinic Platform. The Mayo Clinic is considered the best and most highly renowned hospital in the world. And in recent years, both Professor Zimlifwa and Eric Harnish had been working with big data in healthcare, the result of which in, is the Mayo Clinic platform, which we will learn about in more detail later. Welcome you all, and thank you for being with us. Each panelist here will talk briefly about some of their ongoing collaboration projects, and we will then discuss the opportunities of impacting health that are already happening and that could change access to quality healthcare in the coming years. And to start, I will tell you about a hospital in Latin America, in Brazil, Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein, what we have to do with innovation and healthcare. So Albert Einstein is a philanthropic and not-for-profit institution that was founded by a group of visionary physicians in 1955 and why they built a hospital as the way to give back to the Brazilian society the receptivity the Jewish immigrants and the Jewish community had when they are 
coming to Brazil after the Second War. Since the beginning, the purpose and the mission of the hospital was to have to be a point of reference in terms of excellence, healthcare, also in knowledge generation, and with a strong base to support as the social responsibility. Through all these years, and looking to have the purpose of the social responsibility, Albert Einstein became a true health system, now spread all over the country, a big country as Brazil with a lot of disparities, when we have managed more than 50 units, ambulatory units in the private sector and in the public sector, seven hospitals, institution of each institution, and also our innovation branch in far regions like Amazon, for example. And we are very proud also, last week we stand in the 28th position in the rank of the news, uh, music ranking as the best hospitals of the world in the 28th position. Also, we were in 1999 accredited by Joint Commission. It's a quality accreditation. The first organization outside the US to have this accreditation. And two years ago, the first in Latin America to have the nursing excellence designation of magnet. But what do we have to do about technology? Investing in a strong electronic medical record, we can provide large volume of data. And with those large volume of data, to implement algorithms and to start projects alone and with collaboration with some of the institutions of the world. Now we have many, three of them here. And we can implement projects towards equity in healthcare. So with generation of data, with highly population with diversity, we can implement those initiatives using technology to promote equity. And we have here some examples, like AI my, and imaging to avoid diagnosis errors in the public health system, also uh, remote support of ICUs using telemedicine, and AI to support practitioners. But I will talk a little bit deep about our programs of telemedicine. We know that Brazil is a large country, and we have lack of physicians, mostly in the extreme north of the country. So in North State, in Central West State, for example, we had the opportunity to use telemedicine to provide secondary care to population that if they need to go to a specialist to see a consultation after the primary care physician, they need to go even 24 hours by boat or with a north enormous cost and what we do it's we give the computer with mic and camera the internet sign out in that cities we have now more than 600 cities covered and after the consultation of the patient with the primary care physician when there is an indication to see a specialist they connect both the patient and the physician to the specialist in Albert Einstein, Sao Paulo, in telemedicine center, and they can do together as the primary care physician can help to understand the condition and also learn with the specialist for future case, for example. Now, from August of 2021, from to here, we have more than 200,000 consultations being done together with the Ministry of Health of the country, and this changed lives in that population in the North region, in the Amazon region, for example, and also in the Central West region. This is an example, but we know you can put in telemedicine also artificial intelligence, generative AI, as we started with a project to validate the training of physicians that are not specialists, with AI capability that use the base of more than 2,000 scientific articles to see and to, to learn how to deal in a state 
which has the worst maternal mortality in the country. The worst maternal mortality in the country, as the uh, World Health Organization put the target of 30 deaths per 100,000 births, as the maximum Brazil, we have 141 deaths. It's a very bad situation because of the lack of these issues of obstetrician and specialists. So the system, we use the large language models to understand and to hear the consultation, hearing the pregnant woman and the physician, suggesting questions to the physicians, how he must ask to the pregnant woman, and providing information to the pregnant woman to engage and to lower the mortality in that region. This is on validation. We have a founder of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And if it's possible, and it's go the way we think is going, we can scale to the rest of the world, even in other conditions, not only in pregnancy, but in other conditions, another kind of physicians to train physicians being trained by AI, generative AI, to reach the result we want. But to validate also, we need a robust institution of research or a kind of research with the diversity the world has. So we know that from oncology, for example, since 2021, all the scientific papers on oncology has less than 5% of Latins, less than 5% of the patients engaged in these trials are black people, for example. So we don't have diversity in big trials until now, and oncology is just an example. So what we are doing, we have an incubator, a innovation directory, and this incubator, the Eritz Mew, we had the EP Health startup that create a 100% online base, the EP Science, and with this base, we can reach a number much higher of patients that can be engaged participating online with a mobile app to input what they are eating, input what, how they are living, even the blood pressure. And with all this uh, information, we can, the physicians can use a mobile app also to see in real time what's happening with this research and also engaging the diversity that Brazil has is different from other studies that use only Europeans or Americans and they don't need to go every time to the center of research just to collect the blood sample to measure the cholesterol. We have 28 centers in Brazil. So this is another example how we are using technology also in research. And we believe that technology can be a key ally in the quest for equity and quality, especially regardless of origin, race, nationality, or social class of the patients. Thank you very much. Professor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for including me in the panel. And I think you just heard why, as a professor and the leader of uh, international medicine at City of Hope, we are so proud to be in a partnership with uh, Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein in Brazil. So I represent uh, one of the uh, national cancer centers. Hopefully this will switch to me. And I really wanna talk about how we feel the privilege of our National Cancer Institute and the uh, incredible philanthropy in our organization to really bring technology and expertise and teamwork to all of those we touch and all of those that we can develop partnerships with. So we are, um, again, we're at the rank eight, the best hospital overall in America. We are one of the 56 comprehensive cancer centers. We're one of the founders of the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network and the guidelines for the treatment of cancer, both solid tumors and hematology. 
um, we also are a magnet recognized hospital. So, you know, if you have enough experts, it's amazing what you can apply for. And again, the work of all of the people trying to uh, provide better care to every patient and to be the best place to work. It's important for all of us that the staff that we work with also love coming to work because that really resonates with the patients. So again, who are we? We provide um, bone marrow transplant. We're the largest bone marrow transplant organization in the country. We've done 19,000. We're rated number one every year in every category. We have cutting edge cellular therapies. We have over 800 clinical trials. Last week it was 900. Um, and we're really focused on personalized precision medicine through testing of people's tumors and germline so that we can learn who to treat. As we heard, we are looking at large, diverse databases and working internationally so that we can represent all people to understand their genetics, social determinants, and other outcomes that impact their cancer and diabetes outcome. So again, um, we integrate ac across all specialties and we are serving um, almost 150,000 patients per year. This is all done through a common EPIC an electronic record and a large data warehouse and a large Poseidon research database that's available to, for use for insights and for quality improvement. So if we look now, we now have over 40 network sites across the country. We started a little teeny uh, area of Southern California and now in that area, sorry, past that one too much. Um, in Southern California, we have two large academic centers, 35 clinics. We partner then in three other states, Arizona, Chicago, and Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, uh, Illinois, and Arizona, and including with a large genomic institute. And so um, all of these people work together. And then um, in we expanded starting in 2012 for international relationships. And here, we basically have relationships in China. We've done a lot of work in China. We do second opinions with physicians and patients. We have a large program in Ethiopia, Ethiopia helping them learn to do pathology and basic things. So we do tumor boards. And then we have a very sophisticated relationship with Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein, which is the top cancer center in Latin America, where we share faculty, we have visits, we have fellows come, we really share expertise and common tumor boards, and really learn together and share cutting edge science. And that's really very satisfying. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about, since uh, this 2021, this deep relationship and partnership, this is a beautiful Israelita Cancer Center and City of Hope, one of our buildings, but we use platforms to help do tumor boards synchronously and asynchronously. We can look at pathology, talk about radiology, and really deeply go into complex cancer cases uh, that people may have a question about, or talk about standard cancer cases cancer cases that we want to uh, use for teaching purposes. And then we have in-person. The fellows come and we develop personal relationship with them. Some come and do more research and they take that expertise back to Brazil and Brazil faculty come and our faculty go there and we learn from each other. The other um, major thing we've done for many years is we have been the center to teach cancer genomics to the world. So City of Hope developed an expertise back in 2001. We've, we've taught almost 2,000 clinicians in 50 states and 35 countries. It used to be an in-person intensive genomics course. Now it can be done virtually or in person. That's followed up with web conferences, with case conferences, and a very interactive clinical consortium of experts around the world who can share genomics that are changing every day. If I go to our precision tumor board as a breast cancer expert, I learn something every time. And I would remind any of you that know about genomics, you may have heard about BRCA1 and 2, the most common uh, mutations that can be in families at risk for breast and ovary cancer and others. For 30 years, that was an unknown significant gene. And just like now, as we expanded genomics to many, many other um, uh, populations, we may think a mutation may not be significant until we study it in enough detail to learn not only whether it impacts a cancer outcome, but how to treat it. 
The other thing that we're really proud of, we have three other quick initiatives that really also help improve access. One is that Ravi Salji, our department chair, works with our large genomic program, help define specific mutations, particularly in lung cancers, that then led to three FDA-approved drugs. So having this high-level science that could directly impact better treatment for patients everywhere in the world is another important aspect of a comprehensive cancer center. In addition, we have... Um, Monty Paul leads a large project. We have a very large microbiome project. Our gut bacteria determines our immune reactivity, and they were able to take a certain uh, probiotic, give it to patients who had the same type of kidney cancer metastatic, and then those who got the probiotic with the same treatment and immunotherapy, there was a very significant improvement in disease control to the point now that it's going into phase three randomized trials. To think that we can add a probiotic to our standard treatment and have people do so much better is another way we can apply science and learn together through microbiome. And lastly, we have a large natural language uh, model, which is really trained on over 8 billion pieces of information in 200,000 patients. They can now real time take a patient's complex medical record between imaging, radiology, uh, different formats of information and do a summary of that patient that can be provided to a clinician in real time. And especially for people that have four and five episodes of cancer and are blessed to live 10 and 20 years now to find out what they had, what they got, how they did and then where you're gonna go next can really make second opinion, third opinion consultations so much more effective. And they have a way of not having it hallucinate. So I've been working with them and we're very excited to use them in preauthorization, but in helping our physicians do better um, more quickly and then comprehensively spend time with patients. So that's the way we're, we're using technology, teams and expertise to try to improve access and really thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Bosselman. And now to talk the incredible health work that being done in Israel, Professor Zimlichman from Sheba Medical Center in Israel. Thank you, Sydney, and uh, it's a pleasure to see everybody here. Um, I'm going to speak for a couple of minutes about Sheba Medical Center and our innovation program called ARC and what we're doing with that and specifically talk about, uh, uh, about equity, which of course is our topic for today. So a few words about Sheba Medical Center. Um, Sheba is a very large campus. It's uh, the largest hospital in the Middle East with about 2,000 beds, 10,000 uh, professionals, about 3,000 uh, uh, nurses and 2,000 doctors. You see some of the num numbers here. Since rankings were already mentioned, we're ranked uh, by Newsweek as number nine in the world. But of course, we have Mayo Clinic uh, coming up with number one. So uh, <laughs> nobody is comparing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit uh, tough to match. Um, and uh, in 2019, after many, many years of doing innovation at Chiba, we decided to establish our global platform called ARC for two reasons. One is to have innovation lead the transformation of healthcare, because I'm sure most of you know healthcare has many, many challenges that we were not able and still are not able to solve with our current uh, solutions, uh, whether it's uh, health equity as one of them, patient safety and quality. Uh, we have a lot of issues with workforce, not enough nurses, not enough doctors. Uh, we're completely non-sustainable. In this current uh, stage of how much healthcare costs, we're going to hit a brick wall in a couple of years uh, as we reach unsustainability in especially, of course, the developed countries. So we need to find innov innovative solutions to transform the industry. And this is exactly what ARC is setting out to do. How do we tackle those challenges? Not with the same solutions we've tried so far, but thinking completely out of the box to come up with different solutions. Number two, as we try to do that, we're also focused on being an engine of growth for the economy because healthcare has that capability. If we're doing something good for patients and it actually works, we have that capability also to drive the economy. I'm not saying only in, in terms of making money, but also in terms of creating jobs, also in terms of improving the quality of life, also in terms of bringing foreign investments to countries that otherwise are lacking in foreign investments. So there's a true capability for healthcare to, be, to do good all around, both in the life in patients as well as our economic stability. And this is exactly what ARC is setting out to do. 
Okay. So to do that, we're focusing on digital health because we do understand, and I think we all agree, that digital health is the main transformation vehicle. This is what's going to cause most of the change in healthcare over the next 10 to 20 years. I say to some people, listen, if we could go 20 years into the future and look at healthcare, it would be completely unrecognizable in our own eyes today. And it would be because of digital health, much like what digital health did to banking and telecommunication or digitalization at, at large, to banking and other industries. This is what's coming up with uh, healthcare as well. And within digital health, there are these six areas, sorry, five areas we're focused on, from precision medicine, and some topics were already covered before, we're very focused on as well, to extended reality, there's a lot of that going on with uh, South by Southwest. It's going to drive huge transformation in healthcare over the next couple of years, especially augmented reality. Of course, our biggest effort is artificial intelligence. I'll speak a little bit about this in a minute. Bioengineering with creating the right sensors that will allow us to monitor patients and monitor healthy individuals. We all already are doing this, but this will be a huge change into the next coming years. And of course, remote care. Where do we take telemedicine next? Telemedicine is not only our ability to have a video conversation with our doctor, which is already here, it's no, no, no longer innovation, but what are the capabilities of remote care next? How can we truly transform healthcare with telemedicine? And international collaboration was already mentioned by uh, my previous uh, colleagues and will be talked about in this panel. We think international collaboration is critical if we're really going to drive large-scale transformation. And again, this is exactly what ARC is setting out to do. So we're constantly looking for like-minded organizations all over the world. We're active in about 20 countries. And you see some of the organizations here, whether it's in the US, Canada, uh, Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa, and South America. We work with the partners uh, here uh, sharing the stage with me uh, and many, many others to do a lot of uh, um, innovation together and transformation together. No one organization, even not Mayo Clinic, sorry, Eric, <laughs> is going to figure this out by themselves. It has to be a joint effort. We have to work together because of this huge, huge challenge ahead of us. And we owe this to our patients. So I think this is the way to go forward. And specifically, when we talk about uh, about um, health equity. I wanted to very briefly in a minute sort of describe a couple of things we're working on. Of course, this is a topic for a much larger conversation, but within artificial intelligence and specifically leveraging large data, including generative AI, when we talk about controlling diabetes, for example, patients with diabetes need access to care, which is something that not everybody has. But when we talk about new sensors, when we talk about artificial intelligence and our ability to drive high level care for diabetes patients, even the ones that are dependent on insulin. This is possible even in the most remote communities using telemedicine, using artificial intelligence. Today, nurse practitioners can, can work by themselves to balance and control patients with diabetes who are treated with insulin using AI as decision support. And this is something critical as we move forward. Number two is point of care artificial intelligence diagnostics. When we think about diagnostics and imaging today, we think about very complicated and expensive technologies, right? Uh, even ultrasound, which is quite simple technology, you know, we need to wait un until we get an appointment. We need to get there. It takes time. There's a lot of effort that goes into it and workforce uh, that goes into uh, ultrasound, not to mention CT and MRIs and others. With artificial intelligence, we will be able to completely change diagnostics and have a nurse come to our home, home and co completely conduct, for example, a cardiac echo or uh, abdominal ultrasound uh, using a smartphone and a $50 uh, ultrasound probe uh, where AI will be reading the, the pictures we're seeing. So this will completely change how we do diagnostics over the next couple of years. And then access to mental health services where there's huge demand all over the world uh, with PTSD and other psychiatric conditions uh, where we don't have enough psychologists, we don't have enough psychiatrists. This is going to create a huge difference as we see generative, generative AI coming into play with diagnosing and treating patients with uh, a common psychiatric conditions. Well, actually, next week, during the HIMSS conference, we're going to announce together with Microsoft a new development where generative AI is actually being found to be superior to psychiatrists in diagnosing conditions. And I'll let you in a little secret, their generative AI is even more empathic than the psychiatrist. So a lot to wait for over the next couple of years. I don't know what's going to happen with the doctors and what's their role to play. 
but that's another topic. And then finally, on remote care, of course, and this was already mentioned, when we talk about rehabilitation and we talk about specific cardiac rehabilitation, huge problem with access to cardiac rehabilitation. On average, in the developed countries, only 20 to 30 percent of patients that are eligible for cardiac rehabilitation actually get it. And this is in the developed countries. Imagine what happens in the low uh, to middle income countries. And so how do we allow cardiac rehabilitation to be remote where it's completely independent, run through our smartphone and through a small um, um, sensor like a Fitbit that costs about $60 completely revolutionizing how we uh, provide access to cardiac rehabilitation. Childhood obesity, the same huge problem all over the world as we know it. And we can do a lot of work. We've been able to really improve our care for, uh, for uh, childhood obesity using digitalization. And finally, high-risk pregnancy. And I want to share briefly a very short example where we're actually doing a home hospitalization for women with high-risk pregnancy, saving them weeks and months of being hospitalized in the hospital. Uh, until they give birth. Uh, we have programs in other parts of the world where we reach out to provide these programs. Also, by the way, in the Palestinian authorities, you yet might see that photo down below, where we provide um, home hospitalization for women in the Palestinian Authority with, uh, um, with high-risk pregnancy who don't have access, obviously, to the high level of care that they need. So uh, overall, I think a lot of examples and, of course, a lot of potential, but this is just the beginning. And mark my words, 10 to 20 years, we won't be able to recognize what healthcare looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zimichman, about your speech. And now, Eric Harnish from Mayo Clinic, the first place in the ah. we rang. <laughs> well, if Thank there's you. one word uh, that I want everyone to remember is ecosystem. That's what Mayo Clinic's uh, built for 175 years and really our focus moving forward. Um, as I've, they've jokingly made fun, uh, we are number one. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, I really want this group to know is that if you look at our history, our founders 175 years ago said, we need to be a teaching institution. We're going to go to the Shebas of the world, the Albert Einsteins of the world, the city of hopes. We're going to learn and we're going to invite those people back to learn. And so sharing that open innovation has been core to Mayo Clinic. And so this topic today, the health equity, uh, how do we drive that? I think it's really interesting because I think all of us come from a privileged place uh, that I want to ask a couple of questions. I'll say a couple of facts. So there's 137 countries designated as low to middle income. That's 63% of the countries out there. It represents 75% of the world's population. So three out of four people are low to middle income. So when, when Mayo, when we talk about we're very proud of 1.3 million patients that we see every year, that is a fraction of the people that we can bring our knowledge to. And so building this ecosystem that I'm going to share with you is critical to how do we bring Mayo knowledge uh, and, and Sheba's knowledge and Albert Einstein's knowledge to take care of patients that really need our help. We have uh, three major sites, Arizona, uh, Florida, and Minnesota. Um, so uh, every eight years we elect uh, new CEOs. So we have term limited CEOs. Our current CEO had three pillars, Cure, Connect, and Transform. And they were really, how do we continue to lead uh, with our 175 years of innovation and cure how do we bring our in-person experience digitally? How do we do that integrated care model digitally? That was connect and then transform was, what do we think about platform business thinking? And I share this diagram, it's sort of core to our strategy for our platform. When people talk about disruption in industries, they talk about organizations like hotels taxis with companies like uber airbnb and what mayo said is what we all know healthcare needs to be disrupted we don't want to be disrupted by a technology company 
providers want to do that. Albert Einstein wants to do that. Sheba wants to do that. City Hope wants to do that together. Together, we want to be part of leading it. So what is our role? So Mayo said, let's let's find a way to enable solution developers. And if you think about it, these are the riders in Uber. They're the producers of solutions. The healthcare providers are all of these low to middle income, regional, rural, community-based health systems that want the power of AI. They don't have the expertise to develop. They want to know it was validated by Albert Einstein. They want to know it was validated by City of Hope. They want to know it was validated by Sheba. So the, the data network was really important to that because while Maya's data is rich and deep, it's not necessarily broad and diverse. We have a lot of Norwegians in Minnesota. Uh, we have lots of diversity in Arizona and Florida, but we went to South America, we went to Canada, we went to Israel. Uh, in a month, we'll be announcing several partnerships in Asia, Africa, and different areas to show that we're building out a global ecosystem of diverse data so that when somebody asks that algorithm developed is it going to work on israelis is it going to work on brazilians and so how do you uh, do that without having this data uh, to test it and so that's been our goal many people ask well what is mayo focused on because you're talking about an ecosystem if you think about apple in the app store what seven apps are branded apple the rest are all ecosystem partners these are key areas where mayo is making larger bets um, in terms of advanced care at home how do you help patients when you look at statistics people do better in their home than they do in the hospital room. less risk of infection they're around their loved ones so what do we think about that early disease detection how do you go predictive um, and so you know Onward radiology, strong area of AI. And then uh, one that we're really excited about is digital pathology. We think that's going to be a significant area of growth. So this is just one example I'll share how tough AI is. So one of our physicians created an algorithm that was to look at a 12 lead ECG and predict low ejection fraction, which is a precursor to thinking about heart failure, strokes, and what was interesting was um, when he showed the algorithm to echocardiogram experts, they said, well, the only way you're going to be able to validate this algorithm is that we're the gold standard for that. So when you think you have a positive, you'll have to send it to the echo lab. And he's like, exactly. And they said, wait a second, we're overwhelmed already. We don't have capacity. And so we ran this algorithm in silent mode for several months to really study the patient's then we moved it into uh, working with the echocardiogram lab. And then people came out with questions like, hey, I got an alarm on this patient and they were about to have a hip replacement. Does that mean I can't have a hip replacement? And so you think about all of the workflow rules and all of the ways, and AI is just, uh, you know, it's very complicated, and then how you adapt it to different cultures. And so in this case, we ultimately found a successful algorithm and Mayo being an organization that's primarily healthcare based, we found yet one more company to commercialize it. So I just leave that as an example of uh, kind of what we've done with innovation. I'll turn it back over to Sydney. <laughs> Let's begin conversation here. So I will start with uh, Professor Zimlichman. Uh, anyone who has been in Israel knows how much the country believes and invests in innovation. Innovation is naturally a collaborative process. How do international partnerships foster innovation in medicine and which opportunities can have the greatest impact on healthcare, assess equity at a global level? Why? is orchestrating global innovation ecosystems a growing trend? So we've spoken already about the importance of, um, of uh, global ecosystems. Uh, we are in a day and age today where um, technology allows us to collaborate with everyone. 
Um, I typically start my days speaking with our partners in Australia because the time zone difference, it's their end of day. And I finish my days speaking with the West Coast of the US. And in the middle, if I have to speak with a colleague from Sheba, many times it's on Zoom as well. So obviously technology allows us to work with everybody. And so it's up to us to really find the most appropriate organizations to work with. Um, and we're lucky to be in this day and age, to be able to work with each other. That wasn't the case 20 or 30 years ago. This allows many opportunities to really bring innovative solutions together and compare notes between each other. We're thinking about what would the hospital of the future, for example, would look like. Um, many hospitals are building new facilities. They're thinking, how can we build new facilities um, in a way that's not the same way we've been doing this for 100, 150 years? None of us have that solution. We keep on building the same. But if we come together, we really are able to share ideas and really take this to the next level. And this is exactly what we do with our ARC, in, Arc uh, innovation platform to bring all these uh, like-minded organizations together to have these conversations on very different areas. When we talk about health equity specifically, you know, we work with the WHO and several com countries in, in Africa um, to really build the next version of what would uh, a clinic, a primary care clinic look like in a low to mid middle income country? What kind of technology, digital solutions will be able to be served in that part of the world? Because they're very cost effective and they bring um, accessibility to services that otherwise would never have been there. And we, we are able to show, and I've given some examples before, that some of the things that now we are using in, in other developed countries can easily also be applied to uh, low income countries. So I think there's a great opportunity there. The next couple of years will, sh will show us that. And this is probably the way to push forward as we talk about health equity and access to high level care. Agree. And we are talking about data. And talking about data, I will ask to Eric about uh, artificial intelligence and other technologies rely on huge volumes of data to ensure accuracy, especially when it comes on health. So, ICE and Shiba are both part of the Mayo Clinic platform Connect, a first of its kind global alliance involving a data sharing network that transcends language barriers and accelerates AI based solutions, using data science to promote better patient outcomes. So, the Mayo Clinic pioneered the use of big data in healthcare, led by John. Dr. John Alank, one of the world's greatest experts in healthcare innovation. How does international data sharing impact and change what we know about medical treatment? Is there a future in healthcare without looking at global data through an integrated system? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you look around, there are so many regulations that are asking for organizations to show evidence that they have data that work or that their products work with different patient populations. Uh, the EU just recently revamped their MDR status. And, you know, it's caused some companies, uh, like I know, Fortune 50 companies to say, uh, when they're asked for all this additional evidence, they're actually looking at their sales volume and trying to justify, should I even continue to do business in that country because of all the additional regulatory work? So I think uh, having access to this global data set of, of historical data is actually fast-tracking health innovation and allowing people to maybe justify smaller clinical studies, uh, more precise areas that they want to study. Um, as uh, Eyal said, I don't think the challenge necessarily is technology anymore. It's actually regulatory and privacy. Uh, we all have a responsibility to protect patient data. Uh, we do anonymization. We do federated learning uh, in order so the data never leaves the country. Uh, and that's been especially uh, important to all of the partners we've worked with. So I think really what's, what's limiting, uh, is, is navigating regulatory in, in a lot of these areas. And that <clears throat> on data, I talked to Brazil, for example, the heterogeneity in Brazil is a, must be a global asset because when we put this volume of data with some 
oranges like the and diverse population that we have for example in brazil we can use to elsewhere in the world using an analysis of this data how different genetic environment lifestyle factors interact to influence health outcomes agree at all now dr bosserman we are talking about oncology one of the fields of medicine that has advanced the most in recent years. It's important to note that the incidence of cancer increased worldwide, whether due to modern lifestyle habits of aging of the global population. It's the second leading cause of death worldwide, and by 2030, it's expected to be the first. So how can international collaboration that we are talking about, new technologies and use of big data and AI contribute to more personalized and accurate treatment of different types of cancer. And how technology can help make this treatment more accessible also. How will this technology revolution impact patients? So thank you. I think Genomics is a great place to start. You know, in a lot of our work with our international collaboration, we found a founder mutation from families in Mexico. It led to a specific mutation and a new treatment paradigm. Until we have the world database of what mutations are in different people, we can't target what the best treatments are. We can't develop it, we can't target it. So these databases, particularly on what people are born with, their germline genomics, and then tumor genomics that change over time, and then the microbiome, we need to put that together in data sets so we can sit with an individual patient. It isn't just breast cancer. It isn't just that it's triple negative or that it's HER2 positive, certain of the biomarkers. It's also the setting, it's also their health, and it's also the genomics. So databases can do that. And then through connection tumor boards, we have three kinds of tumor boards, regular cases, and those that no one knows the answer to. And we can get people on a phone call with experts around the world who know that disease to ask what would be the next best thing for this patient. And how will we get clinical trials so that whether there's a patient, one in each country, two in each country, that have a certain set of characteristics that they can have access to a treatment through clinical trials that we can network through technology. That'll be the biggest. Everyone who doesn't have a standard treatment ought to be offered a clinical trial and technology can empower that so we can continue in my 45 years in medicine to think we could cure melanoma or cure some of the things we've done was unthinkable. And it's through technology and discovery and that we have to share with others. Thank you. Before I'm going to, I have other questions here, but I want to know if there is any question from the audience, if there is anyone who wants to, to ask something to the panelists. Just in regards to the de-identification and equity with people, I'm thinking about insurance. If, if the information gets leaked, which it happens, what are the legal implications of insurance companies using that information to stop people being able to take out insurance or make claims because I'm seeing that that's actually going to increase the disparity for people and their fear of coming forward because their data will not be protected and they will not be able to get insurance policies. I mean, that's where policy makes a big difference. And one of the big things with Obamacare and other things that we have is you cannot discriminate for pre-existing illnesses. If we're here to have health, we can't discriminate for those who have issues or past uh, mutations or past illnesses. It needs to be that you can't discriminate in selling insurance. And I think that's a policy issue. But these, these will be future ones. And there's always somebody who can get, they want to get that information. So people might get their illness later. So is there a policy against possibly getting that illness? Like if somebody's prone to getting ovarian cancer, then 
they might not be employed in that company. They might not, they don't have it now, but is there, are there policies in place to say, well, yes, they, they could go on to get that illness, but we will still employ you. Let's speak for California, where we have huge predictions for genetic information. You would lose a lawsuit if you didn't hire someone because of a genetic risk. But that's California. Not every state has that, and not every country has that. So, I, but I saw that you're sharing the data with China, and China doesn't have any legislation on that. So, but you're saying none of the data actually leaves America. It doesn't go to China because once it's in China, then it, it can be shared. Yeah. So. Um... So our architecture is federated. The data never leaves the institution's secure cloud. or um, But it is anonymized. So I think to the point about, um, about people re-identifying the patients, uh, your insurance example, is really unlikely because we have an audit process when somebody runs their algorithm and they extract what I would say are aggregated insights that they're not taking out any row level data. And even that row level data is de-identified. So you wouldn't actually know any patient data. And we don't let them combine. A lot of people, when they talk about risk of re-identification, it's when you bring in other data sets like SDOH and so forth. We don't allow people to to bring in other data sets because it does increase the risk of re-identification. So you don't combine any of your data set so that can't yeah. happen like netflix example was supposed to be de-identified but they could still work out who the people were sorry i didn't catch that. Net- netflix had a de-identified where you could pick the film that you liked and you didn't actually give away your identification but they could actually track people even though it was supposed to be de-identified it's an interesting read so i wouldn't want to give up my information <laughs> knowing if it was being shared in other countries. If I may comment as well, um, you know, th- obviously this is an issue that um, um, is concerning, um, you know, data privacy is something that there's a huge amount of effort already going into this to make sure that uh, the data is completely secure. Um, we're getting there, uh, but as we look into the future, there's no question that uh, we need to solve this issue so that there's zero risk to uh, identification of data because Otherwise, we're missing on a huge, huge opportunity. Uh, the opportunity to learn from data and come up with new drug discoveries and come up with uh, new solutions that will improve healthcare across the world, both individually as well as to populations, is huge. And that's why it's, this is an effort we always need to stay on top of. We continuously need to find solutions to allow us to uh, leverage data for these scientific discoveries that would help us live a longer and more healthy life. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentations about uh, precision medicine <clears throat> and actually really helping to extend uh, availability to treatment and other services for people. Um, it does. It also struck me that in all of your strategies, you had uh, ideas about um, advanced home care and changing the site of service from the hospital into the community. Um, I did see on the City of Hope slides about um, a commitment to supportive care. And so I'm really interested in understanding where you see technology playing a role in reducing pain and symptoms, um, in expanding access to palliative care, and in um, helping caregivers understand what their roles are, especially when you're shifting that side of service from the hospital into the home. I can say, I think one of the big movements there is with the patient reported outcome tool, having the patients prompted either by disease, by drug, by condition, answer a set of questions. You can have, you know, proactive and reactive triage by expert nurses. You've got home monitors for blood pressure, early detection of high-risk infection. We do our bone marrow transplants primarily now as an outpatient, but they're under significant monitoring with nurse triage. So that's another way to really keep people connected. And you do have to have the caregiver training and then, you know, make sure there are the caregivers. We have a, a hospital on the campus now, an outpatient 
campus site that people can go to when they may be unstable. They don't need the hospital, but they don't have a home locally to go to. So there are a lot of these innovations that are connected by technology. We are just in middle of ice in Sao Paulo. We are just in the way of uh, launching the new building of oncology in our hospital. And you are talking about uh, some technology involved to palliative care also inside the hospital but like color therapy, like some therapies to, to reduce pain, as you said. So there is, a, a, I think, a, a avenue, a pathway, a, a great pathway to use technology to give wellness to the patient that deserve uh, palliative care. The, just to maybe just to add uh, one last uh, thing, you know, definitely moving to the home. This is what palliative yes. care is probably the most important type of, uh, of service we need to have at home because we want our loved ones who are suffering to be in their natural environment with their uh, family members rather than in a hospital. And we all know that this has been what's going on over the last 100, 150 years where we pull people that are sick into hospitals. That doesn't make yes. a lot of sense, especially when we talk about palliative care. So the um, you know technology that will allow us to, uh, remote, to perform remote care monitoring we have monitoring tools today that measure pain without the need of the patient to actually comment uh, we have a measure for pain we can measure through uh, uh, brain waves and eeg which we're utilizing uh, so there's a lot that's going to happen in that regard over the next couple of years we talk in icing when the patient indeed needs to be the hospital we bring the home to the hospital and okay. but we aim to bring the patient at home and bring the hospital to home my comment is on the uh, model for COVID-19 in developing a treatment where the shared resources and the shared responsibilities are spread out. Uh, validation is spread out by the government, responsibility spread out, you know, again, bottom and private industry, and the cost or lowered as the shared responsibility. Do you have any idea, comments on trying to work with that and trying to develop a path to that type of model? Yeah, I can take that. So uh, I would recommend looking this up, uh, CHAI, it's C-H-A-I. It's the Coalition for Healthcare AI. There's, it started two years ago with about five founding members. It's now at over 1,200 and the FDA, the ONC, others have been involved in defining what does clinical validation mean. Uh, and what I think is really exciting is uh, it's, a, it's really a, a coalition that's actually influencing government policy. You've seen President Biden also do some executive orders on, on validation and testing. And so I think, uh, I think there's a lot of positive things coming. I do think you have to balance, um, you know, balance things, but I think there's definitely a lot of that work going on. So we have two minutes. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Congratulations on the great work. Um, I think you covered partnerships between providers. My question is, I think there's no way forward that's sustainable and to get to get to where we'd achieve without collaboration in a broader perspective, not only between providers, but also between pharma between payers and so on. I'd like to hear your thoughts on collaboration with, with other stakeholders um, to move forward and to achieve better outcomes. So we, we um, at ARC, um, I shared the slide of the providers, you're right. Uh, there's another slide I didn't bring up, uh, which has our uh, partners in the industry. And we work with uh, uh, several pharma companies, medical device companies, uh, as well as digital companies such as uh, uh, Microsoft, Google, and others. Um, um, to provide and develop new solutions uh, that are needed um, in the healthcare industry. Um, I think it's critical to do this. Uh, we also have a, a, a think tank called FOH, Future of Health, which are the leaders of leading healthcare organizations from around the world who get together to sort of uh, um, brainstorm about what healthcare needs to look like 10 to 20 years from now and how do we get from where we are today to where we need to be. This organization started uh, seven years ago with having providers only at the table. It took us a year or two to understand that we're seeing only half of the story. Uh, it's like asking hospitals to think about the future of health and hospitals would say, of course, 
we always need to be the center of the universe, right? That will never change. And so we started including others, including uh, uh, payers, of course, um, including uh, policymakers and the politicians who also obviously have something to say, uh, including industry and including patient advocacy groups because patients need to be at the table. And now we have all the stakeholder groups around the same table to uh, make these decisions. And I only want to take us all back a couple of years to the pandemic. We seem to have forgotten about COVID and nobody said the word yet on this panel, right? <laughs> uh, amazing. Uh, but uh, the world was saved uh, through pharma. Where we would have been today without the uh, vaccines and how quickly they were, we were able to, uh, uh, to bring them to market. Uh, and, and Shiba played a big role in that, uh, working with Pfizer to provide the data on the boosters, for example, uh, so that it became national policy and international policy. So huge, huge potential. And just to remember, the, the study that I showed it was uh, studied together with Novaris, that study about cholesterol. So it made the change together with the pharma. So sure. I, I think I don't have, <laughs> we cannot have, out. yes. So, where are we? Thank you very much. Thank you. Finalist, eight o'clock.